So we're starting a new series, um, Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the government of Jesus Christ today. Um, you know, and, and this, is, this is so cool. The top, top looking at this, um, 2020, just looking at that year really quick, uh, it, it, it was really an amazing year. Um, by the grace of God, um, we not only survived, but we, we thrived. Um, we launched two very powerful ministries, Ignite the Thumb uh, and, and We the County. And this is so cool. I don't know if you know this about We the County, um, but we already have over 800 members. We're in 67 counties. We're in 17 states. That's, that's the Lord. And, uh, and this is what I like. One of those 17 states, Hawaii. So when they get a big enough group, I need to go out there and talk to them, right? That's right. I got to go to Hawaii and talk to our bros and we the county Hawaii. Yeah, buddy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, man. We grew. We also grew in Sunday attendance. Our attendance picked up uh, on the average for, for uh, 2020. And we had the most prosperous year financially we ever had. Uh, you know what? And then, you know, I'm thinking about this, and I'm talking with Brian right before service, and Brian, you know, he's, well, he's like, well, yeah, you know, it's, the church grows under persecution, right? 2020 was the most persecution I ever experienced ever as a Christian. I mean, the church was under persecution last year, under attack, to shut down, to not sing, to do, and we're like, well, I don't th- I, we need to get together and we shut down for a little bit, and we said, okay, enough of this. <laughs> Let's get together. And, and, and through that, we had one of our best years ever. I mean, we grew in love. We had, we, I think we understood more about love and family and faith. A lot of powerful things happened. Um, praise Jesus. It's all glory to Jesus. Man. So if they crack down on us a little more this year, <laughs> what's it going to bring, baby? Come on. Come on. I don't know, but it's going to be good, right? Come on, God is so good. You can tell I'm fired up, can't you? All right, yay. Okay, so what I see now, now you've heard this, but I wanna, I wanna start off, I, I think we're about to head on, a, on an amazing adventure. I really do. Okay, so this is what I see for um, 2021, what, what I see and I believe. Everybody might see things a little differently. That's okay. The church is receiving a greater revelation of the government being on the shoulder of Jesus Christ. This will manifest in part by what we said before, the Queen Esther decree, and I believe this is part of how that's going to function. The small business patriots in the church will stand up as one voice, so loud it's going to shake the deep state. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The government is upon his shoulder. So that's just kind of a brief statement and then kind of, expounding on that. Today in America, there are many wicked Haman. Remember, Haman was that guy in the book of Esther that hated the Jews and was going to hang Mordecai, and he ended up getting hung on his own gallows. But today in America, there are many wicked Hamans who have plotted against God and his people. They are being exposed and brought to justice. I believe this is just starting. I I believe it's going to continue. God's righteousness is being poured out. These people have abused the justice system, putting wicked people in courts and in government, so that at just the right time, they'll overthrow the righteous, the patriots, and all of God's ministers. Um, This group of people is called the Deep State. They have manipulated our constitutional rights and have put people in bondage instead of protecting our freedom. The system they abused will be their gallows. They will be hung by the Constitution. How and when this will all unfold, no one knows for sure but I believe it's rapidly approaching. I feel we've already entered into this. So with with that statement kind of leading the way for 2021, um, big picture. I want to give you the big picture of the kingdom of God. We're going to start right at the beginning, and we're going to go all the way through into Revelation really quick, okay? And then we're going to take um, weeks to break all this down, but I I want to give you... The more I study about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, they're they're synonymous. Blows my mind. I mean, it is like, wow. If if we could really get the revelation of what the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven really is, if we could really get that into our heart and walk that out, wow. 
Wow, wow. Uh, That's that's the purpose Jesus came, is to put the kingdom in our heart and then wants us to walk it out. Uh, It's so powerful, so, so, so powerful. So here's the big picture. A greater understanding of the kingdom of heaven will result in a greater understanding of the government of Jesus Christ. God partnered with man to rule the earth. Right from the very beginning, God partnered with us. Okay? God created Adam and Eve, male and female, in his image and gave them dominion over everything on the earth. You know, the stinking enemy wants to do everything to break the word of God. If the word of God says this, then the enemy's going to try to create a culture that's opposite of what the word says. And that's part of the conflict that we're in right now. This is the battle, the anti-word of God against the word of God. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. Kingdom of, of Lucifer, or Satan, kingdom of Jesus Christ, God. I mean, they are like warring together, but we know the end of the book. Light wins. <laughs> kingdom of God wins. Kingdom of heaven. Yeah, buddy, that's us. Satan deceived Adam and Eve by twisting the word of God. And boy, do we see the twisting of the word of God going out there today. I can't believe people who do what they do and then try to use scripture to justify abortion. People have done that. Satan deceived Adam and Eve by twisting the word of God, and they gave their authority to Satan. Adam and Eve gave away their authority. And that allowed Satan and his his dominions, his demons, to come in and take authority. Eventually, the earth became very wicked. Fallen angels mated with women and their offspring were the giants of old. And this is, I I can give you scripture for all of this, and I know this isn't anything new to most of you. Um, And they were called the Nephilim, or the Nephilim. This corrupted the DNA of God, because all mankind had that God's DNA, but then this corrupted that DNA. So God flooded the earth to destroy the corrupted DNA before the entire earth was corrupted, because Noah and his family were not corrupted, Neither were the animals that they brought onto the ark. From Noah, so so the whole world gets flooded. God starts over with Noah. Again, there's God partnering, partnering with man. God said, okay, Noah, build an ark. Uh, what's that? <laughs> it's a ship. Big ship. Well, why? Well, it's going to rain. Well, what's that? Um, water from the sky and water from underneath coming up. Okay. So he builds this ship, takes him 100, 110 years. God partnered with man. See, this is God. Now, God could have had it flood, and he could have just took Noah and all those animals and went and raised them up and let the flood drown everybody, and he'd go and put them back down. But no, he partners with man. All throughout the Bible, he partners with us. We have to see that, that, that we are joint heirs With Jesus Christ, we're kings and priests. If we could see the authority that we have and walk in that. And so from Noah and his three sons, the world started to repopulate. It grew to 70 nations who became one language, all in unity. And then they built the Tower of Babel. The one world order existed 3,000 years ago. The Tower of Babel became known as the Gate of God, as they were trying to reopen the gate to the false gods that were destroyed in the flood. So Jehovah God came down and confused their language so they would scatter. God called Abraham. Now this is where where God comes in again. God partnering with man. God calls Abraham, changes, well at that point it, it was Abram. God called Abram and he changed his name to Abraham, meaning a father of a multitude, because God wanted to create a nation of his own people that would keep his word and pass down his word generation to generation and through his people bring the dominion uh, of, this, of, this, of the authority of God back into this planet. So God, through Abraham, created a people of his own, a nation of Israel, knowing they would protect the integrity of his word. Israel became a nation, and God picked David to be the king. That was God's choice. 
And through the bloodline of David, he would bring the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So, see, again, God partnering with man, with Abraham. And then God said he's going to bring the Messiah, what? Through the bloodline of a man, of a king, of his choice. And isn't it so cool that King David uh, was a humble shepherd boy. And, and that was his job, was out there protecting the sheep. And, and what's Jesus known as? The great shepherd. It's so cool when you look at the comparisons and everything. Just to show you that it's not by accident. So in Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, we've heard this a lot. And it's titled, The Government of the Promised Son. And that's from my, I got this uh, Spirit-Filled Life Bible, New King James Version. That's what I use. And so that's what it's titled in here, The Government of the Promised Son. Because the more we understand about the government and, 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 and the kingdom, they go together. The government of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God go together. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those are some pretty fantastic titles. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward and forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, this was a prophecy about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was given 700 years before it happened. And it also wraps in that the understanding of the true kingdom of Jesus Christ, which not only started when Jesus was crucified, but then it won't have its fulfillment until Jesus comes back the second time. And both of that is indicated in that prophecy. Not only the first coming as the child, but then Jesus as the ruler of everything. It's really, it's really powerful. So we're going we're gonna to break this down just a little bit. So, for unto us a child is born. This child is the Messiah, who shall be born to reign forever upon the throne of David. The Messiah, who is God, Upon the throne of David, who is man? God partnering with man. God partnered with Adam and Eve, we know, at the beginning. And this affirms the continuation of that partnership. Now, the term, these terms are, 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 are wonderful. Wonderful counselor basically is one word. There's, there's a comma in there, but a, a lot of scholars believe wonderful counselor is one word. And this is what my footnotes say. This is likely one name that expresses his ability as a political guide and leader. He is the living word, the infallible source of guidance, the inexhaustible wisdom, the truth, and the way. So wonderful counselor. And then mighty God, another term, mighty God. The child is the incarnate, the omnipotent one. The word translated mighty has the additional meaning of hero. You talk about all the superheroes? Jesus is the superest of all. <laughs> I mean, come on. When you, when you, you see these um, movies that are out there and all these games and all the superheroes and the X-Men and this and that and all this stuff, those are movies, but there's a real one. There's a real superhero that can fly and walk through walls and, and is invisible and can walk on water, and, and can turn, you know, stones into, into food. And I mean, I just absolutely amazing, okay? He is our hero. The Lord is the infinite hero of his people, the divine warrior who has triumphed over sin and death. I'm so glad that he leads us. Come on. I mean, when the enemy tries to come against you, just remember who's with you. Come on. Jesus, the greatest warrior of all. Now, everlasting Father. Now, that might sound a little confusing. Jesus is called the everlasting Father? Doesn't that kind of mess with the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Understand the context. The expression, Christ's fatherly care, that's what this means. It expresses Christ's fatherly care. The name is not in conflict with that of the first person of the Trinity. 
Because uh, Jesus said to Philip, he who has seen me has also seen the Father. Because all three are one, and yet they're all separate parts of that trinity. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's in John 14, 9. Everlasting, he's the everlasting, can also mean everywhere present. Everywhere present. He has the divine attributes of both eternity and omnipresence as he rules upon the throne of David and within the hearts of the redeemed. So cool. And then Prince of Peace. I like this. Prince of Peace. His reign will be characterized by shalom. That's the word here. We, we've heard the word shalom. And it means health. You, you should be expecting health. Because your, your Lord is the Prince of Peace. It's health, it's well-being, it's prosperity, it's happiness, it's cessation of enmity. That enmity is, the, is strife, it's division, it's conflict. And the, 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 the source, the main source of that conflict and that enmity is, is Satan, who's the ruler of this world. And, and he... He is going to be put under our feet. We have authority over him. We can tell him to shut up and don't listen to him. That's what the Prince of Peace does. He gives that peace in our heart, which is the authority over the, the demonic realm in this world that causes conflict and tension and hate and fear and all those wicked things that are part of the, the culture of this world, of the kingdom of this world. We have authority over that. You have authority over that. You've got the Prince of Peace inside of you. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it, establish it with judgment, justice from that time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Zeal. The zeal of the Lord of hosts is going to do this, is going to carry this out. Ah, I get so much peace in that as well. Knowing that, okay, all this kingdom, all this warring, all this battling, all this kingdom stuff that's going to happen around us, God's going to carry it out. It's not like it's up to us to win the battle. We just enter into it, and then with his power being the hero, he's going to save the day. But just like David, who had to slew Goliath with the rock, he, the only reason he entered into it is because he knew that the Lord of hosts was on his side. And he knew that it wasn't him fighting the battle, it was the Lord of hosts. And who is this Philistine that challenged the Lord of hosts? He ain't nothing but dead, that's what he is. I mean, he came, and then it says when they came down, this is so cool with King David, this is the courage we all should have. This is the boldness that we all need to get in us. Come on. It says that when they came down, it says that not only was Goliath in front of the army of the Philistines, it says they all came out together with, with Goliath in front of them. And here's just David, just little old David. And it says he ran towards them. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't shaking. He's like, what am I going to do now? They're, they're all standing there. He's like, oh, you guys don't even know who you're messing with, man. <laughs> Bing! Sinks that rock into his head enough to knock him out. And David didn't have a sword, a spear, nothing. And David goes up there, takes his own sword, cuts his head off with his own sword. Talk about humiliation. <laughs> and he's like, who got your head? Come on. That should be our boldness, you know, against that demonic realm. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. It, it not only just says the Lord of hosts, it says the zeal of the Lord of the hosts. Zeal means enthusiastic devotion eager desire, single-minded allegiance. Come on, it's, it's, it's fervor. That should be, in, God puts that in us to want to carry this out. And that's also in God. God's excited about carrying out his kingdom. He's excited about bringing back his rule and reign. And the Lord of hosts, that term is a military term. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an expression that is used to show that God is not only God on his own, as if that's not enough, but he has all of the hosts of heaven's army with him. How more powerful could you actually picture someone? First Samuel um, in 1745, 
It says, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And then he picked up that stone and ran at him. And Man, that is, I should get you excited. 1 John 3, 8 through 9. Now, this, this also translates to us. Look, look at the New Testament. Now, in John, 1 John 3, 8 through 9, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. This is what Jesus came to do, is, is to destroy the works of the devil. And he started this. He, when Jesus went to the cross, he took all authority of, of this planet. He had all authority in heaven, and he really had, he, he's God. He has all this authority. But it's like this legal transfer that took place when he, when he was crucified and shed his blood and how that happened. Then it took the authority back that Adam and Eve lost in the beginning. And so now, instead of Satan still being the ruler of this world, now Jesus Christ took the authority of this planet back through that system because God's not a liar. You have, it, it takes a time to, to explain all of this. And God gave the dominion to Adam and Eve. They gave it away. And the way back then had to be through the sacrifice. It had to be the shedding of blood. And Jesus, who was spotless, was then... Um, uh, crucified by the enemies of, of darkness, which then they lost their authority in this. And when you understand about the power of blood and, and how things work with covenant. In John 12, 31, and it says, now is the judgment of this world, this is Jesus speaking, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So here we see that the power to cast out Satan from being the ruler of this world was in the cross. That, that's what Jesus said himself. Jesus called Satan, Lucifer, the ruler of this world. And he said that my cross now is going to cast him out. It's going to take his authority out. And then Jesus gives this authority to us. Jesus, Jesus did what he was going to do. He went to the cross, took all that authority, right? He crucified, rose from the dead, gives us this authority, and says, I'm out of here. You guys take care of business. I'm going up, sitting on my throne in heaven. I'll be orchestrating everything from up there. You guys take care of business. Oh, and by the way, spiritually, you're seated with me in places of authority up here. You're with me. Okay. So see yourself as from heaven and my perspective, and now go down there and rule and reign. I'm going to give you my authority. Luke 10, uh, 18 through 20. And he said to them, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's prophesying that. He said, I'm seeing this, because here's the start of his kingdom 2,000 years ago, where he starts this taking the authority back, the government of Jesus Christ. And he said, I, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Did you hear that? The spirits, the demons are all subject to you. You have authority over every demonic being. Over every principality, power, rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts of wicked and, and heavenly places, you have authority over every one of them. They are subject to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have that kind of authority. You should fear nothing. The spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name's written in heaven. That's the greatest thing of all. I mean, our name is written in heaven. We're saved. Hey, it's all good no matter what happens to us. <laughs> Jesus says that's what you rejoice in. Jesus gave us the authority of his government, his kingdom, to continue his purpose. In Acts 26, 15 through 18, we see this again reflected in what uh, Paul and his conversion, the apostle Paul. God is so good. Aren't you glad for his grace and mercy? Paul was perhaps one of the greatest apostles. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. 
And at one time, it's kind of like the King David thing. King David had a heart after God, but King David did some nasty stuff. I mean, adultery? And, 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 then, and then kills the husband of, of the girl he sleeps with? That's pretty nasty. But he repented and had that heart. If we truly repent, it's amazing what God... Paul, so here we go, New Testament. Paul, when he started off his ministry... He was, he was zealous to murder the Christians. That was the start. He had another ministry before he had the ministry of Jesus Christ. He had the ministry of the, of the Pharisees and wanted to destroy the Christians. And when Stephen was stoned and killed, Paul was there encouraging them to do that. But then the Lord Jesus grabbed hold of him and said, I got a purpose for you. Showed himself, and, and Paul repented and turned his life completely around. And this is that testimony. So I said, who are you, Lord? Because this light appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And he said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I have yet to reveal to you, God always has something new to reveal to us. I love it. I love it. It never gets boring being a Christian. If it gets being boring being a Christian, your eyes are not open to what God's doing. Because he's always going to reveal something new to you if your eyes are on Jesus. Come on. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes. This is what we're all called to do. A lot of people out there are blind right now. They can't see. I can't believe how crazy people are and how stupid they are with what's happening. I'm like, I can't believe you can't see the truth while well, they're blinded. And it's up to us to open up their eyes to tell them the truth, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And then we keep moving forward with the kingdom. We're talking about this whole time of, of God's kingdom from the very beginning and God partnering with us and all the way through. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was there a place for them found in heaven any longer. Remember when Jesus prophesied and said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So the great dragon who was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This battle is shaking the heavens. A lot of people, I, I believe this is taking place. Hebrews 12, 26 through 29 speaks of this. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And when God says that, he's, he, he's not talking about shaking that heaven. That heaven can't be shook. That heaven cannot be shook. It cannot be shaken. The second heaven, the kingdom of darkness, the demonic realm, where the principalities and powers are, that can be shaken, it will be shaken, and it is being shaken. I believe that's what's happening right now. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. The things that can be shaken, the kingdom of darkness, Satan, his realm, the principalities and powers of darkness, the rulers of this age and of this world, that's being shaken. So it can be removed. So only this remains. We're in the process of that. The total fulfillment of that will not happen until Jesus comes back. How it all plays out and pans out, none of us know. But I believe we started that process. And it's an exciting time to be alive. Come on, perhaps the most exciting time ever in the history. And it says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, understanding about the kingdom, let us have grace 
by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And then it wraps up in Revelation 11:15, which is on our wall. It's one of our theme verses. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there's a loud voice in heaven saying, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Come on. That's, that's from the beginning, talking about the kingdom and the glory and the government of Jesus Christ from Adam and Eve all the way through until it comes back again onto this planet. And we're in the last part of that story. Pretty cool, isn't it? Isn't that cool how all that fits together?